I'm Jen Tilford, and um, I'm Director of Undergraduate Curriculum Management, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I work to align and ensure accuracy of curricular sources by collaborating with faculty from all undergraduate academic departments, as well as with other key departments, such as the Academic Program Liaison, the Office of the University Registrar, the Office of Academic Programs, and the Committee on Curricula and Courses, which leads me to my co-presenter, Dr. Marianne Bickle. Hi, everybody. Um, I am currently the Director of Bachelor of Interdisciplinary Studies. And what that does is we help students who have been around the block a little while. And they're searching for a way to graduate. And it also helps the military and veterans who have, who are out in the field or are non-traditional learners. Um, but my background is actually in retailing. And so I, I got to this path in a real non-traditional way myself. But um, how I really got into student-centered curriculum is that um, back in the early 90s, I started learning about online learning when it was just in the infancy. And ever since then, I've been really passionate about curriculum. And Jen and I met when I became on curriculum and courses. And um, that's how we started to collaborate. So that's how it started. Jeff? Yep, and it's great collaboration. I've enjoyed working with you, Mary Ann. All right. Um, so today, Mary Ann and I would like to talk to you about the link between quality curriculum, quality teaching, and quality learning. Uh, we will leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so. Um, Feel free to go ahead and enter any questions in the chat box in the meantime, and we'll make sure we go back through those as we're answering any questions um, at the end. Uh, so let's get started. I want to start off by um, going over some learning outcomes that we hope to impart to you today, uh, including an understanding of the relationship between curriculum governance, curriculum management, and curriculum implementation knowledge of the curricular framework for changing or adding new curriculum, the purpose of curriculum management, concepts of quality teaching, and resources to assist in the curriculum process. I will start off with an explanation of what I've encountered in curriculum management over the last few years. Uh, we've had many advances in curricular tools including Banner, DegreeWorks, which is our degree audit tool, Major Maps, and the Bulletin, which is getting a new vendor or has a new vendor this year. Um, if you haven't checked out the new Bulletin, you should go see it. Um, it. It has a different look to it, but it's very in line with our, um, our, our vision or our view that we have here with marketing on our website, and it's very easy to use. Um, but with the utilization of all of these new tools, it became apparent that there were discrepancies among the curricular information being published in our university sources and in its implementation through advising and enrollment. Here's what's been happening. Faculty create curriculum, the bulletin, banner, degree work, and major maps display curriculum and advisors communicate curriculum to students. Any ambiguous, vague, or indefinite degree requirements leave room for interpretation. And this can lead to things like inconsistent advising practices, uneven application of courses to degree requirements, student confusion on degree requirements and applicability of courses, uh, hours needed to reach total degree hours becomes difficult to calculate. Uh, programming of degree work becomes complicated and student extended time to degree. 
think of faculty like doctors who write prescriptions and advisors or like pharmacists who must communicate the doctor's instructions to students. If the prescription is unclear, it becomes difficult for the pharmacist to fill it and communicate the appropriate dosage to the patient or student. So how does this happen? Faculty so deeply understand their field and the curriculum requirements needed that oftentimes they don't include how students will complete those degree requirements. That's left up to advisement. Many times things are left out like courses that are applicable to more than one degree requirement, acceptable course substitutes and optional or exemptions for, from certain uh, requirements. Since these rules and practices were not included in the written curriculum, advisors must make decisions. If various advisors are making decisions, then there are likely inconsistencies in how students are completing degree requirements. How do we fix this? First, we need to use the bulletin as the one source for curricular information. Websites and departmental materials should link to or refer to the bulletin to keep information consistent and up to date. We need to explicitly state all degree requirements in the bulletin uh, and limit double counting or sharing rules and make sure we state any such rules. Have prescriptive degree requirements that make it easy to understand for advisors and students what's required and include any progression requirements so that students are aware of all expectations. Curriculum management seeks to help in this. It's the oversight involved in maintaining accurate, clear, consistent, and cohesive curricular information with the purpose of increasing student success and enhancing the academic advising experience. Curriculum development and decisions are the responsibility and authority of the faculty. Curriculum management includes working with faculty on designing courses and curriculum according to policy and to best leverage online educational planning and advising tools. This ensures that the decisions that faculty make are actualized through a cohesive workflow with a reduction in duplication of effort, increased curricular transparency, and a reduction in misadvisement. Please see the workflow presented here in which faculty would have many resources available to them before beginning the curriculum creation and modification process. Resources include a one-stop online location containing information like, um, or information on curriculum policy, design best practices, the ability to request a curriculum consultation, tutorials on student and advisor educational planning tools, and curriculum approval process software. Uh, checklists for proposal proponents, and timeline expectations for proposals. All of this information is meant to inform and assist faculty in the creation and modification of curriculum. After faculty have created their curriculum, then the curriculum management team interprets the content for the academic bulletin, degree work, and banner course catalog which faculty then sign off on and enter into the curriculum management tool, which is currently apps, but will become course leaf next year. With the resources that inform faculty and interpretation of content into university curriculum sources on the front end, the approval process should move smoothly for publication on university curriculum sources. This cohesive workflow and framework also provides the foundation to reach our goals in curriculum governance, curriculum interpretation, and curriculum implementation. I'm going to briefly go through those goals now. Curriculum governance goals include all proposals moving through this framework to promote curricular cohesion, all undergraduate programs in the program of study format, training for academic departments on curriculum policy, best practices and tools, and adherence to academic deadlines. Goals for 
for curriculum interpretation include the alignment of university curriculum sources, pre-approval of curriculum changes with the bulletin, major maps, degree works, and standard course catalog prior to entry into the curriculum management tool, and inclusion of all necessary information in proposals, leaving no room for interpretation. And finally, the goals for curriculum implementation or advisement and enrollment include students having accurate degree audits and lost education plans each semester. Students changing majors must attend an academic advising session to make any adjustments to their degree audit and education plan. And students will have a complete degree audit prior to graduation approval. An understanding of the three-tiered framework of curriculum governance, curriculum interpretation, and curriculum implement implementation uh, allows faculty to create and modify curriculum with an understanding of how the information they provide will be used to display and communicate curricular requirements. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann to talk about quality teaching and learning. Mary Ann? Okay, so now, up till now, everything is behind the scenes. Um, what faculty need to do before it gets to the student. So right now, it's where we get to the course syllabus, where the students are actually going to see how we're going to be engaged. In order to have quality education, we have to have student engagement. So the quality curriculum is everything that we heard about up to right now. Then we have quality teaching. The quality teaching is where the syllabus comes in. And it's where what kind of activities you put in, what, what kind of content you put in, what kind of instruction you put in. And the overlap between the curriculum and the teaching results in quality learning. And if they don't overlap, you're going to have a breakdown in quality learning. And we know that happens. We absolutely know that happens. And how do we know that happens? You, you know, if you've ever left a classroom and said, wow, something fell flat, well, you know it didn't happen that day. Let's go to the next slide. So we know for a fact that in order to have quality teaching, there needs to be three types of interaction. And if anybody in the audience has ever put together a proposal for a new course um, and you've had it sent back, you might have had it sent back because you didn't list the types of interaction and you'll, you'll say, boy, they're really being picky. No, we're not. We just want you to understand that the interaction has to be there because it's really easy to forget. There must be student to student interaction. There must be student to content interaction, and there must be student to instructor interaction in order to have quality teaching. And it's kind of like if you don't have all three, you're going to have a breakdown in um, quality teaching. So think of it this way. If you were driving a car and you only had three tires on your car, your car wouldn't work. Well, it's kind of like that with quality teaching. If you only had two of those, the quality teaching would be par. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll have some examples that will help you better understand what, what really is the interaction. This interaction is true whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or distributive learning. Now, distributive learning is um the word we use at the university of south carolina in the literature you'll also hear distributed learning um, be used as online learning um, uh, some people also call it virtual learning 
So student-to-student -student interaction, it consists of when students work together to complete required assignments. And now sometimes students will say, but I really work better alone. Well, what they're really saying is, it's easier for me to do it by myself and I don't want to rely on others. Yes, but then you're really not getting that engagement. And we know for a fact that engagement is so important for quality learning. So here are some things that are important. Team projects, group assignments, skill-based student interaction, and pair-to-share assignments. Here's the kicker, though. If these assignments or student-to-student -student interaction do not relate to the student, do not relate to what they will be doing in their workforce environment, it's not quality teaching. So in other words, if you ever hear the students say, well, oh, this is just busy work, we have failed at our teaching activities. So the activities, the interaction must be relevant, it must be related to the content, and it must be related to the students. And if you're thinking, well, can we do team projects in an online course? The answer is yes. The student to content interaction is where the student is using course concepts. Um, it is it's reinforcing course concepts. It might be videos, books, lab equipment, audio equipment. And, and, and what's really important is if you are requiring material, you're requiring them to use it from beginning to end. If you require them to buy a textbook and you only have them use one chapter, it's going to decrease the quality of the teaching materials. And then also student to instructor interaction. This will be the student, the lectures, the emails, the announcements, the office visits, and that can be virtual office visits as well. Now, what's so interesting about this is um, facial expressions matter, um, personality matters. How does the student feel? Uh, how approachable are you? You know, and it's interesting, you know, when we give an email, we can really sound rather terse, can't we? Um, I, I know I can. And so it was very important that when you put something in writing, you know, how does that email come across? Uh, how, how does it, you know, does it sound um, a little too blunt? You know, so make that instruction or interaction really approachable. Let the students know you're here for them. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's have some breakdowns. Um, it, is, it is incredibly easy to have a breakdown in student-to-student -student interaction. When the activity is poorly designed, you know, it's rather easy to design an activity that's poor. Um, when the activity is not connected to learning objectives, or when students think this is a mindless exercise. Now, the exercise could actually be extremely good, but if you do not remind them why they're doing this exercise, they're gonna say, I, I don't get it. Always give them a roadmap. Tell them again and again, why are you doing this activity? The breakdown in content is when something is not used throughout the course, or it's a waste of their financial resources. One of the best things I did for one of my courses, a 100 level, is I, I dropped a very expensive book. It was a $150 book. And I used open access resources. And um, I did that after a presentation at a CTE um, web, uh, presentation and I learned about open access resources and here's the thing um, my background is retailing and some of my students they have quite expensive purses you know uh, really nice stuff but it's not my job to 
be judgmental or to say, well, you know, they have nice purses. They can afford the books. Or students have really nice cars. That's not my job. My job is to be diligent in my course. And it's interesting, by changing the resources, I actually made the course better. So that's something to think about. And then the breakdown in student to instructor interaction is, you know, if you don't listen to opinions, you know, students do have really good opinions, you know, and, and it can make the course better. Or if you don't follow the course syllabus, you know, that course syllabus is actually a contract. And remember that. And if communication is irregular, inconsistent, or unclear, I happen to teach online courses even before the pandemic. And students have commented to me, they said, you know, we know when your announcements are going to come out. Well, I communicate with them every single weekday between 8 and 9 a.m. I didn't realize that they recognize that, but I'm a creature of habit. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And they'll say, and you and you give us the day. And I'm like, well, you know, it's real important to give you the day so you know which day I'm making the announcement. So be consistent. Consistency is real important, probably for everybody, but especially for students. How about we go to the next slide? Okay, so curriculum management, that's before the syllabus is published, and then quality instruction. Make sure your learning outcomes are managed via your syllabus. So your learning outcomes really guide your syllabus. Install quality measures via how you interact. Be consistent and really make learning meaningful. Students really like it when they know why they're learning something. What is the purpose of this? And let's go to the next slide. Now, I'm going to do the top part, and Jen's going to do the bottom part. In the curriculum approval process, we do have a new website that's coming, Course Leaf. But um, here's what's going to be coming um, to help people, help faculty and um, staff. We'll have some checklists on when you are developing a new course or changing a course or a major, we'll have a list that will say step one, step two, step three, step four. We'll also have tutorials. Um, they'll be short, and they'll be easy, and they will be online. You know, one of the nice things uh, about our technology is you can learn about things from the comfort of your home or from your office. And we'll also have a rapid response guidance team whether your course, you have questions about distributive learning courses, regular courses, or simply about the curriculum and course process. So you'll have three different options of who to call immediately. So you're not submitting the proposal and then just say, oh man, it has to go back because I made a mistake. No, you're going to have a team to help you. Jen, why don't you tell them about curriculum management resources? Sure. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so for curriculum management, um, you know, I've already been kind of doing this over the last few years of working with faculty um, when they want to make changes and just kind of helping them with the program of study format, which um, is kind of um, is a universal format uh, or uh, for our undergraduate program that has academic terms that we can use to refer to our parts of our degree program. Um, and so I, I help faculty with organizing their curriculum and uh, maybe ask them questions about it. Um, and I answer questions as much as I can and point, point them in the direction of a person who may also be able to answer a question um, better than me. So that's kind of part of that rapid response guidance team. Um, but, you know, I try to answer the questions when I can, but I'm available to work with faculty um, on the undergraduate side, when they are looking to make some changes or maybe come up with something new as far as um, a program or a minor, I'm happy to look over those things. Um, and <clears throat> I'm working on a curriculum management manual that has some useful resources 
Um, we're planning to have a central ticketing system um, where faculty can go and submit a question and then we route it to the correct person so that they can get a quick answer. Um, the academic programs website is always a wonderful resource for faculty. Um, there are already um, a lot of tutorials there, information on timelines. Um, you can pick between making a course change or, or a new course um, or pro doing things with programs, whether it's new or a modification to a program, and then get specific information on the type of change that you're making. So they've done a lot with that website over the last few years. Um, and then Course Leaf um, is going to be our new system. Uh, it, we already have it for our bulletin that was um, published in uh, July, uh, end of July, in the new system. Again, if you haven't gone and looked at it, go take a peek. It looks great. Um, navigation is very easy and intuitive. Um, but we're also going to be, or we're currently starting to work on um, Course Leaf curriculum information management, which is going to replace apps. And so we're going to have a new system that has a lot of bells and whistles to help with the curriculum approval process. Um, and so that's why uh, we kind of we went through this lean process over the summer and came up with um, ways to improve our curriculum approval process. And so that's kind of what Mary Ann was talking about with we're creating a website. We call it kind of a one stop shop. Uh, for faculty where they're going to have those checklists, tutorials, um, and then the, you know, the contact information for um, the several people we have on our rap rapid response guidance team, and then the types of things that they can help you with as well so you know which person is the appropriate one to contact. But of course, if you contact the, the wrong person, we'll, we're always um, willing to help and point you in the right direction. <clears throat> 